Welcome to the history section, the lunch, the fireside chat uh, with many of our distinguished leaders of the American Pediatric Surgery Association and North American Pediatric Surgery. We uh, have a great session planned for everybody. I want to highlight uh, uh, two colleagues that have really done all the work for this, uh, Dr. Kristen Zeller, from Wake Forest, trained at Riley, who is going to be stimulating the questions of our distinguished panelists, who we'll introduce as we go along. And also Don Nakayama, Don, there's Don, is going to be roving in the audience to uh, stimulate additional questions and answers for many of our distinguished guests today. So with that, while you're all coming in, let me turn it over to Dr. Zeller. Thanks for coming today. Um, just a Brief moment before we get into our video tribute to Dr. Judah Folkman. Um, it was really a pleasure to put this video together. Um, and I had a lot of help from many people to provide the content. Um, but most importantly, um, his lovely wife, Paula. Um, so without further ado. Oh, we'll see it there. I will do. Yeah, you can look at there. Mm -hmm. We can watch it right here. Moses Judah Folkman was born in 1933 in Cleveland, Ohio, to Rabbi Jerome Folkman and Bessie Schumer Folkman. His mother prophetically chose biographies of scientists like Isaac Newton as the bedtime stories for her young son. Rabbi Folkman, his father, he wanted his older son to follow in his footsteps. And at a very young age, seven or eight years of age, he would take uh, Dr. Folkman yes. at that time, Judah Folkman, to the hospital to visit patients that were in his congregation. And he would have Judah sit in a chair off the side and just watch his father interact and see how his father engaged them, interacted with them. Judah really developed a lot of the same characteristics. Some people even refer to him as rabbi surgeon. Before starting his surgical training, he gained experience working in the surgical labs of Dr. Robert Zollinger and later Dr. Robert Gross. He trained in general surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital, and when drafted into the Navy, spent formative time doing research at the National Naval Medical Center, where his groundbreaking study of angiogenesis began. At age 34, he was recruited to succeed Dr. Gross in the post of Surgeon in Chief at Children's Hospital. In preparation, he trained with Dr. Koop in Philadelphia for six months. Once at the helm in Boston, his research faced skepticism from the scientific community, and he faced challenges in leading a department of independent-minded surgeons, yet he met the adversity with quiet determination. He handled this adversity, at least on the outside, very well. Hard to know what it was like on the inside. This was not significant to him, but he never showed anger, never spoke badly of people, and just went on with his commitment to his job and to his research. Judah Folkman always says if, if you stand now and look back on his surgical career, it looks like brilliant, well-planned, sequential research, but in fact it was just a series of starts and stops trying to address the problem. His greatest legacy as a pediatric surgeon has to be considered his research and his paradigm shift of developing angiogenesis and anti-angiogenesis. But if you knew him, he had a different legacy. Uh, his legacy was he made everybody around him better. He sought no personal gain from his work. Patents funded his research endeavors, but he made no personal profit. He reveled in seeing critics become collaborators. He was an advocate for women and minorities in science. And he set an example for those around him as he himself remained a perennial student. His powers of observation were unique, and I think this was part of his genius. Uh, his, his patients loved him. You know, he touched a lot of people's lives. I appreciate everything he did for me. And it's a long list. Let's get started. 
Um, so before we um, ask some questions of our panelists, though, first I want to do some informal polling of the audience today. Um, if you were a member of the organizing committee, people we would identify as the founding members, if you're here today, can you please stand? Dr. Leap. <laughs> that would be you, Dr. Leap. <laughs> Good morning. Any others in the audience there? It's so hard for me to see. Um, if you were a charter member, please stand. If we have any charter members in the audience. Yep. There you go. There we go. <laughs> If you were in attendance at the first APSA meeting 50 years ago, can you please stand? At what? The first APSA meeting, meeting. 50 years you ago. Were at, stand up, stand up. Arnie Korn. <laughs> Great. If you were one of the individuals who took the first pediatric surgery boards um, that was given in Puerto Rico, please stand. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> Dale Johnson. Did they pass? <laughs> if you took the second exam. <laughs> so, um, if you have a pediatric surgery certificate with a number less than 100, please stand. That's all you guys. <laughs> Not sure. I think, I think I did, pretty sure. You too. Great. Great. That makes you see too low. <laughs> <laughs> If you had the privilege of meeting Dr. Ladd in person, is there anyone in the room who had that privilege? Mm. Mm. Great. Wow. And similarly, if you had the fortunate, or were fortunate to meet Dr. Gross in person, please stand. Wonderful. Um, anyone in the room who um, has met Dr. Coe in person? Who? Or Dr. Potts. Please stand. <laughs> okay. Um, if you are fortunate enough to identify a woman surgeon as a pediatric surgery mentor, please stand. I can't hear what she oh. says. Excellent. <laughs> and if you can trace your pediatric surgery genealogy lineage to Dr. Ladd. Please stand. <laughs> I think that's everybody. Wonderful. <laughs> that's right. I think she said stand Wonderful. up. <laughs> All right. Let's dive right in. <coughs> so we'll start with Dr. Leap. Um, you played a very key role in the birth of APSA. Can you tell us what motivated you and other surgeons to start APSA when the surgical section of the AAP was already in existence. Sure, let me, let me just first say, uh, I was really touched by that tribute to Judah Falkman. I think he's probably the smartest person I've ever known and also one of the nicest. And it was a real privilege to be a fellow resident with him and know him through most of his life. Um, the, uh, the, the movement to have APSA really wasn't in order to have a place to have a meeting. The surgical section worked very well for us. There were only about 200 of us at the time, and the, uh, the surgical section meeting was a very, very active meeting, well attended. Uh, it was a good home for us, um, and so there wasn't, it wasn't about having a place to meet or, or to, be, to be a group like that. It was about um, establishing ourselves as a specialty, because uh, it may may seem strange to some of you, but at that time, uh, the, the, most of pediatric surgery, I believe, certainly much of it, but I think most of it, was still being done by general surgeons, um, many of whom had had essentially no training. And we, we were not only upset about that, you know, professionally, but clearly it was hazardous to the health of children, and we and our pe pediatric colleagues really thought it was time to have a, a specialty in pediatric surgery. And uh, so the issue was how do we define pediatric surgery and how do we get certification established as a specialty? Now, a lot had, had gone on before that. Uh, the main effort was uh, trying to get board certification. And starting back in 1955, Chick Coop uh, made an attempt and just a couple years before um, we started uh, APSA, um, Mark Ravitch had made an, an attempt. And 
over and over, the American Board of Surgery, American Board of Medical Specialists, would reject our officer, offers. Uh, Bill Clatworthy had led a committee and established standards for residency training, and Steve Gans had founded the Journal of Pediatric Surgery. Uh, but we thought this was putting the cart before the horse, because if you want to have a specialty, you have to have an organization that has the authority to enforce training standards and to set standards uh, and, and, and move ahead for certification. So we, we thought that it was uh, what we needed to do was first get an independent surgical organization and then the other things would follow. Now this was not a new idea. I first heard of it, I was a resident at Boston Children's Hospital and I remember in 1963, Bill Daggett came back from a surgical section meeting and he said, pediatric surgery is not gonna get anywhere as long as they're still with the pediatricians. And I, you know, I, the resident, I didn't think much about it, but a couple years later, by that time, a lot of us were having some frustration about, about the lack of progress, and uh, we decided it was time to move ahead. So Tom Bowles and I decided to see if, we, if there was enough interest, and so uh, Chick Hoop had mentioned that the establishment was never gonna do it, that if, if we wanted this to happen, it had to be you young guys, unquote. So we called up about 20 of what we called young Turks, that's not PC anymore, but in those days it was all right to use that term. Uh, anyway, these were guys who were out of practice, um, not in the establishment, but, but established. I, I was two years out of residency, so maybe I wasn't really established. But in any case, we called up uh, about 20 people, and everyone said yes. And so we got a founders group together, and I've spelled this all out in a history I wrote 25 years ago, so I'm not going to bore you with it again, but I want to just tell one little story which I think is interesting and very relevant. And that is that one of the, one of the things that Tom Bowles did, and part of the idea in our, our working together was he was to bring together, bring to us the establishment, the old guys. And lo and behold, he went around and talked to all the members of the surgical section, executive committee, and the former presidents, and to our surprise, they were all very supportive. So we invited him to a joint meeting, so we had our young Turks, and we had, we won't say what they are, but the older guys, and we had a meeting together, and sure enough, they were all in favor of it, but they thought it should be an exclusive society. They wanted a Society of University Surgeons, or an ASA, and, uh, and the next thing we knew, we were moving along that track, and so the question is, well, who do we, how do we pick these people? Well, we would pick them, and so we said, okay, and so we went around the room, and everybody nominated people, and after a while, it, it became very apparent how ridiculous this was. One of the people there who I will leave nameless nominated everybody he'd ever trained, even one who just graduated the last year. So it was pretty apparent this was kind of a stupid way to do it, and fortunately, we got it back on track, and we were able to form an organization that would represent all of pediatric surgeons, which, of course, is what it does. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Fantastic. Yeah. Dr. Ellis. You're yes. Next. <laughs> So you carry the distinction of being a charter member. Can you tell us what the mood was like at that very first meeting? <clears throat> uh, well, the mood was all upbeat. Uh, but as I recall, uh, the impetus to, uh, uh, to get a journal started, Dr. Coop did that, of course, uh, and uh, uh, to get an organization started, Dr. Lee mentioned about that, and I know some other people who were involved in that too. The, uh, the impetus was to get those because we were sort of told that that was a prerequisite to uh, having uh, to, uh, to take boards. But uh, in Texas, we had our organization. We were affiliated with the Texas Pediatric Society, which was very independent, uh, later became a, a section of the Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, but they were all supportive. Uh, and I, I don't uh, remember anybody that was negative uh, about uh, the idea of pediatric surgery beco becoming a recognized specialty and, and uh, getting boards. Okay. So it was all upbeat. Good. And how many days was that first meeting? How, how long was the first meeting? Was it a couple oh, days? Well, actually, uh, 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 I couldn't stand when you uh, asked about the number of meetings. I missed the first meeting in Bermuda because I was by myself. Uh, but I did not miss another meeting uh, all the years until about a year or two ago. So I've, I've attended pretty well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I think he gets a gold star for attendance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Great. Dr. Corin, 
Um, how has APSA helped advance the practice of pediatric surgery, both here in North America and worldwide? Well, I think uh, having an a, a organization that allows you to uh, be as significant as this one allowed us to go into other parts of the world and show what we've learned to do uh, in uh, the America in terms as pediatric surgeons. Uh, I think uh, early on that wasn't done so much, but later on I think a number of us found that we could uh, help a number of pediatric surgeons overseas that didn't have the same facilities, the same experience, et cetera, to do the surgery the way did, we did in, uh, in, in, in America and especially in Boston Children's Hospital. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one of the major factors there. Is there anything that stands out um, as something in your travels that you have brought home with you that has influenced your practice here? Yeah, you always learn something no matter where you go, whether it's a, a small uh, country, a big country, a small hospital, a big one. We learn, you learn a number of things from them, and we teach them a number of things that we know. So, Arnie, you also have the distinction of being affiliated with a unique group of uh, surgeons in their training, the Magnificent Seven. Tell us, tell us who, who those guys were. One, one of them is out there. Bob, stand up. <laughs> That's the, Bob Bartlett over there. <laughs> well, talking about egotistic, uh, that's the ultimate of it. Uh, we were seven residents at the Peter Bent Brigham Hospital, uh, and uh, two have passed away since a uh, uh, few years ago. Uh, and we were very close, uh, helped each other in a time when we were working all the time. Uh, wives of those that were married uh, hardly saw us uh, more than once or twice a week. Uh, and we would, it was, we would just really became bolded, molded together. We'd help each other. Uh, if somebody uh, had a big problem, we would help them and cover for them, etc. And we all learned from each other. Uh, I think we were able to find out a lot about uh, pedi pe not pediatric surgery there, of course, general surgery but from each other. It was a great group and uh, obviously then had the great opportunity of being under Francis S. Moore, who was one of the great, pedi great general surgeons in the world. Mm -hmm. He was my idol in terms of uh, making a decision uh, to be in pediatric surgery. I had a, a little vignette that um, I had decided uh, when I got out of medical school that I was going to be an internist and was going to uh, uh, really uh, be a scientist, basically, as an internist. And uh, on the, when I went to the fourth year uh, um, thing in, uh, uh, in surgery, it was at the Beth Israel Hospital, uh, and when I got into the operating room, I said, wow, this is great. I like, I like what's here. And I said, but I know all surgeons aren't very smart. So I don't know if I really want to be a surgeon <laughs> and get into that group. And so um, I didn't know what to do. It was late in the year. You had to make your mind up where you were going to get your internship. And uh, I went and decided to call Dr. Moore. He never, I never met him. I had never seen him before. I just knew about him. And I called the secretary. And within about two days, he gave me a, uh, an appointment. It was about 6.30 in the morning. And I talked to him. And I said, Dr. Moore, I feel I want to, like I want to be a scientist. I originally wanted to be a, chemical, a chemist. And I then decided I wanted to be an internist. And when I got into the operating room at the Beth Israel Hospital, I really loved the operating room. And I said, I really don't know what to do. So he stood up and he said, Arnie, a surgeon is an internist that has learned to uh, uh, dissect along tissue planes. I didn't say anything else. I walked, st stand, stood up, want, went out, and became a surgeon. Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> okay, so it was Arnie Corrin, Bob Bartlett, you help me, Arvin oh, Philippart, Philippart, Steve Rosenberg. Yeah, keep going. Stu, uh, Stu, Stu Howards, who Stu. Was, uh, went into urology. Okay. What was the one we missed, Bob? Rich, Rich, Rich Hicks. Rich. There you go. Gordy. Gordy. Yeah. So, a distinguished uh, graduating class. Mm -hmm. Glad to have that. All right. Great. Dr. Anderson. Can I interrupt and oh. just 
Go right make ahead. a comment that the reason I went into surgery was for any more also. <laughs> I, I was going to be an internist, and I took surgery at the Brigham and was just bowled away. He was quite a, quite quite a, a man. Quite a person. <laughs> it's a, I think it's a common story, the mm -hmm. anxiety. And I think it attracts the pediatric surgeons, in, mm -hmm. actually, the folks who thought they wanted to do something else first but couldn't resist the draw of what we got to do in the operating room. Mm -hmm. Great. So, Dr. Anderson, did you find APSA as a, a new, new organization, um, did you find it to be more accepting of women and minorities? Or were the challenges similar to other surgical institutions that you'd encountered? Actually, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think there was any difference in terms of gender, but there was a huge difference in the requirements. Um, when I, um, I immigrated to this country and immediately went to medical school, or finished medical school, which I'd started in England. I um, then went into a pediatric internship because the dean of students wouldn't let me apply for surgery. <laughs> and then I went into a surgical residency. As you can imagine, and then pediatric surgery, as you can imagine, there was no time to study, interview, and be accepted as an American citizen. So I was not an American citizen when I was eligible in all other ways to join the Academy of, Pedi of Pediatrics. And uh, that sort of put me off a little bit. <coughs> APSA never made that distinction. Hmm. So in terms of the pediatric communities, APSA is my medical home. Now I want to add a couple of other things. Um, we're talking about Franny Moore. I was a medical student at the Brigham and I've known since I was eight years old that I wanted to be a surgeon. So I went to Franny Moore. He gave me an A <clears throat> in my um, medical student evaluation. And I said, Dr. Moore, we're going, uh, my husband and I are going to Washington for two years originally. Would you give me a, a <clears throat> residency in surgery when we come back to Boston? And he said, and I can't make imitate him like you guys can, but he said, well, I'd rather give you a job in anesthesia. <laughs> so I decided I knew I did not want to be two feet away from where I wanted to stand. The only other thing I want to say is, and I don't know how many people in this room know this, but I know because of my science husband, who uh, was good friends with Judah, um, and so I knew almost more about his science than his clinical abilities, he was on the shortlist for a Nobel Prize mm -hmm. at the time of his untimely death. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, Don, are you... Is Dr. Denzler available? Dr. Denzler isn't available, but we're going to have Ed comment briefly. Oh, great. So we're going to turn to the audience a bit. I'm going to stand in a little bit for Dr. Denzler. Uh, as I, I guess they say in the Hamilton musical, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. So I'll be happy to tell his story. Uh, Dr. Denzler was the first African-American trained pediatric surgeon in the United States. Um, he did his training, as you heard yesterday, at Newark. And he finished in 1969, but was not board certified until 1976. In that intervening time, Samuel Rosser, who had been a surgeon who tra trained at Howard and then trained under Judd Randolph uh, and finished in 1972, was the first board certified uh, African-American pediatric surgeon. And then there are a host of other people in that kind of first five or six trained in the United States, Columbus McAlpin, uh, Victor Garcia, Fambe Nidich, I can never pronounce Induforche, Induforchu, and uh, Robin Hadley were among those first uh, group of African-American surgeons. And uh, as you know, Dr. Uh, Denzler uh, did not become a member of APSA until he was honorarily inducted yesterday. So. 
Thank so you. Uh, can we have uh, the we, house lights up for a minute? Because I do think Dr. Denzler is here. Yeah, Dr. Oh. Denzler is right here, and I'd like to Great. have him comment on his early experiences as an African-American African surgeon in Atlanta in the there we go. 1970s, right? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Barksdale. 50 years ago, I was uh, packing up from New Jersey and New York to go to Georgia. Georgia's my home, and I know that they did not have all the um, uh, 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 equipment and uh, personnel that um, New Jersey and New York had but I was willing to go there and to work hard. So one of the greatest things uh, happened to me is both of the anesthesiologists at the hospital I used were trained at Columbia. Uh, and, um, and that uh, you can be the greatest surgeon in the world and don't have anesthesiologists, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and. Um, at the time when I went to Atlanta, there was two other um, pediatric surgeons, Dr. Zwering, he was over to um, uh, Eggleston Hospital, and he gave me a lot of help, and Dr. A. Hollam Stone, he was at Grady, and he gave me a lot of help. And then fast forward, Dr. Ricketts at um, Eggleston gave me a lot of help. So I've been uh, blessed. Uh, to work 30 years uh, in practice and then work another 16 years with the medical school. So and those are the things I'd just like to highlight. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Denzler, for sharing those comments with us. Um, let's see, moving on. Dr. Pena. All right. So you have had a very unique and close relationship with Dr. Gross, um, first as the parent of a patient, um, and then later as a trainee. Can you share some insights um, on Dr. Gross from those experiences? Sure. Uh, first of all, Dr. Gross, <clears throat> when I think in Dr. Gross, I have a great deal of um, appreciation, gratitude, admiration, and good memories. I'm in debt with him for, for life. He operated on my first son, <clears throat> and he managed to, for the administration of the hospital, not to charge me anything. That was in 1965. I spent a few days in, at Boston Children's Hospital, and I asked Dr. Gross if he would allow me to watch some of the operations. I was a second year resident in Mexico at that time. And he allowed me to go to the operating room. And what I saw was a, a master surgeon practicing an, a, operations. And I learned that operations in pediatric surgery can be quick, efficient, smooth, nice, elegant, and beautiful. So I become so impressed that I, that impression never, never left me. So I decided at that particular time to become a pediatric surgeon. Went back to Mexico. And they came back to, to Boston Children's Hospital in 1969. He, Dr. Gross allowed me to become a fellow, research fellow at his laboratory. He was no longer the chief of, of uh, surgery. Dr. Judah Fogman was the chief of surgery. So he only allowed me to work in the lab. For, but then the Vietnam War came, and they drafted a junior resident, and there was an opening, and Dr. Fogman um, accepted me as a as a resident. And I can see the hand of Dr. Gross influencing Dr. Fogman to accept me at that time. And then the chief resident got sick. And um, there was 15 more months to go for that chief resident. He never finished his training. And there was an opening for me again. So I was, as something happened in my life, I was extremely lucky. If you allow me to to tell you a few, uh, just a, I, can, I have many stories and anecdotes about Dr. Fogman and Dr. Gross, but the one th I will tell you one, a brief one, because you asked me to be li limit my time to five minutes. <laughs> so then, <laughs> just as a guideline. <laughs> so one, um, after, uh, we rotated six months with Dr. Gross in cardiac surgery. 
<clears throat> so in the afternoon, all the residents got together in the X-ray department, and we started the rounds by putting the films of the day, of the operation of the... So we're looking at the X-ray films, and that morning we had an operation, a coartation of the aorta. So the chief resident put the film in the view box, and there was a little bulldog clamp left inside the chest of the patient. So the chief resident started crying, literally crying in front of us, and we were trying to console him. He said, don't panic. <laughs> and he was crying and said, what are we going to do? Let's go to Dr. Gross' office and tell him that. So we walk into Dr. Gross. So Dr. Gross, the patient, Dr. Gross did the operation, but the chief resident was in charge of closing and left the little bulldog clamp that we use for the intercostal arteries. So Dr. Gross, there's a bulldog clamp inside the chest of your patient. Dr. Gross' face didn't change much. He said, go there, tell everybody that the patient is massively bleeding, open the chest, get the damn thing out. <laughs> so, we, so we went to the operating room and the chief resident, we entered the ICU and the chief resident said, the patient is bleeding, the patient is bleeding, open an operating room, let's move. And we started pushing the patient and the ICU, ICU nurses yeah, didn't yeah. have time to, to see what was happening. We went to the operating room, the chief resident opened the chest, grabbed the Little, ligated the artery, got the little bulldog clamp, threw it in the floor and put the step with their foot in the, in the bulldog clamp. <laughs> so we closed the chest and then we went back to the, upper, to the Dr. Gross's office. Dr. Gross, the clamp, the clamp is out. Okay, he said, that's okay. So we were very happy. We went to the surgeon's lounge to, to relax and suddenly one of the residents said, what about the film? The film? The film? What are we going to do with the film? <laughs> let's, let's go back to Dr. Gross's office. And Dr. Gross, what are we going to, to do with the film? He said, get rid of it. <laughs> so we, went back, back, we went out of Dr. Gross's office, and then we started thinking, how are we going to do, get rid of the film? So everybody started look. Nobody volunteered to do that. <laughs> So they said, they, I'm sure they thought, who is the person that could disappear the film and get, leave the country in, in a case of a legal, of immediately in a case of a legal problem. So everybody That's looked great. at me and I said, okay. So I, I get rid of the film. <laughs> There are some stories that just can't be told in any other place. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Leap, do you have any comment on that? <laughs> no, I don't know. Off the record, as they say. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pena. Um, I think, is, uh, is Dr. Johnson in the audience? Don, is Dr. He's Don? here. Yeah, up front here. Oh, great. Dr. Johnson, do you have any comments you can share with us about the organization of APSA at the beginning? I was going to tell the story of Dr. Leap, but he's here and he told it personally. <laughs> I think we owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to Lucian to uh, really getting this thing started and uh, stimulating Tom Bowles and Bob Ajant and uh, number of others who were more senior to uh, uh, push ahead with the uh, development of a separate organization for pediatric surgeons. I believe Lucian wrote the first letter of invitation inviting the first, I think, 18 members and founding members. I happened to be invited at the same time. Uh, that was at Chicago airport. I think Lucian also wrote the second letter for the second meeting at the Chicago airport, and finally uh, the meeting at, uh, what was it, the? Pheasant Run. Where? Pheasant Run. Oh, Pheasant Run, yeah. Pheasant Run, yeah. But Pheasant uh, Run. I think Lucian had a major role in keeping in contact and inviting people into the new organization which became APSA, and uh, I'll be forever grateful to him and for the fact that I was be able to be associated with him in those early days. 
Mm -hmm. Dr. Leap, can we ask you to stand? Embarrass you just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all you have done for the rest of us. It was a little, it was a little bit like herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's and, much more glamorous. And in Tom Bowles was the diplomat, and I was the bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a village, we say now. <laughs> well, and it's it's remarkable to me that in that phase of your career, you were all young surgeons, and it was a group of young surgeons that had the energy and the the uh, motivation to put this all together. Um, and as being myself, someone early, getting closer to mid-career, but um, it's a great reminder that the impact we can have and the growth that can come from it, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous example for us. So I see um, Dr. Raffensberg in the audience. <laughs> He's here. Yeah. Yep. I think, um, John. John, you're known for shaking things up once in a while. <laughs> Dr. Raffensperger. Oh. Well, I still don't know why uh, Evolution Leap invited me to be a founder, because I was a totally untrained pediatric surgeon. In fact, I'm still an untrained pediatric surgeon. <laughs> <clears throat> but in this day when we're doing a lot of self-congratulation, no, don't do that. <laughs> I, serious, I seriously think we should ask, has APSA and the boards seriously improved the care, the surgical care of children? And I would also point out that in the last 50 years, we have lost a great deal. What? I started out on pediatric surgery because I was interested in everything. We did cardiac, urology, set fractures. It was wonderful. A great day was to a couple of hernias in the morning, and then maybe a pyloric or a Wilms, and come back in the middle of the night for a gunshot wound or a ruptured appendix. That's really living. <laughs> <clears throat> but I would say that I think that the last of the real pediatric surgeons is uh, Keith Ashcraft and Tom Holder. They did cardiac urology, and everything. Just think what we've lost. I'll bet nobody in this room anymore does cardiac. I'll bet very few people do reconstructive urology. Just think of it. Dr. Swenson originated many of the urological operations, uh, ureteral implant, uh, pelvoureteral stricture, heminephrectomy. <coughs> And now the urologists are sneaking in and taking over all of that. Uh, the cardiac surgeons in any particular children's hospital all of a sudden become cardiothoracic. And they tell the pediatricians, we'll take care of the lungs. Don't let those general surgeons do it. I really think that this is a problem and it's going to continue to be a problem. You've heard of the missing flink, haven't you? The missing flink was a bird who flew in ever-decreasing circles until he disappeared. And if you don't watch out, this is going to happen to pediatric surgery. That each little thing, the liver surgery, rectal surgery, head or neck surgery, will be bitten off by somebody else, and you'll be left doing hernias, putting in central lines. Who in the God's name wants to do that? <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing that worried us at the founding meeting was the disassociation from pediatricians. And there was a group, strong group, who thought, we got to go with the surgeons, you know, the real guys. When in fact, the surgeons were the ones who uh, obstructed pediatric surgery. Look at the history of Coop. The general surgeon tried to stop him. Same thing with Judd Randolph. Uh, but the pediatricians were their only supporters in the early days. How many of you get referrals from surgeons? You get your referrals from pediatricians. And I really wonder if we didn't make a mistake by forming these organizations 
that distance ourselves from pediatricians. And as for the boards, all you have to do is look in the newspapers. Every physician who is ever born is now board certified in something. I think it's become basically meaningless unless you do a great deal to tighten up the requirements that you go back to the idea of fewer pediatric surgeons doing more index cases instead of more pediatric surgeons doing fewer index cases. Thank you. Dr. Raffensberg. Thank you. Thank you. Always provocative. So I see Dr. Ziegler in the audience. I am in the audience, but I'm not amongst these older guys that have been speaking. <laughs> <laughs> we did that He's specially there, for you. <laughs> Don asked me to make a comment about Dr. Koop. And I, I must say, it strikes me very seriously to think that I'm the only living person of the partnership that I joined back in 1977 when I was trained and then stayed on at CHOP. Um, because Harry Bishop, Louis Schnaufer, Jack Templeton, and C. Everett Cooper, as you know, all have died. Um, Dr. Coop was a truly unique guy. Uh, in those days, uh, he used to get two 8 a.m. operating rooms or 7.30 a.m. operating rooms, and he would schedule simultaneous cases. And literally, you know, his goal in life was speed and simplicity, uh, speed to get through a complex procedure with as few motions as possible. I often tell residents that in esophageal atresia cases, for example, he would take out of your non-dominant hand any instrument that you had in it and supplant it with a nerve hook because he didn't want you grasping the proximal or distal portion of the atresia with a forceps and squeezing it. That was a non-starter with Dr. Coop. But in any event, he, he loved uh, sort of more the simplistic approach. He didn't like to make things complicated, but rather how can I simplify and how can I speed uh, the, the uh, procedure up? Uh, his real claim, I think, to fame was obvious as he went on to the next phase of his life, na namely after pediatric surgery, the Surgeon General of the United States. And I think everyone uh, of, of the Public Health Service Everyone in this room would have to agree, I think, that Dr. Koop would be the most recognized face of pediatric surgery uh, in American government and leadership uh, history just because of his position. And as you know, he was a passionate guy. He was a devout Christian guy uh, who, uh, whose Christianity strengthened when his son uh, was killed on the side of Mount Washington during a mountain climbing episode when he was a student at Dartmouth. Uh, so Dr. Koop was motivated by lots of things, but that, that uh, portion of his life, that is the religious or conservative portion, clearly played a role at CHOP. Uh, it was, you know, we did not distinguish who could or could not have an operation. We really felt that if we could do something completely correcting the problem, that that's what we ought to have done. And that was the modus operandi at CHOP in the Coup era. So I think a great leader, uh, a passionate human being, uh, definitely not a guy that was not always non-controversial, uh, but uh, someone who was great to train under and who really, I think, uh, was a major influence in my own personal life, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can't, I'm having a lot of trouble hearing. Dr. Ellis, can yes. I ask you a question about um, your role in the development of the APSA Foundation? NAPA Foundation? APSA Foundation. APSA yeah. Foundation? Uh, well, I was actually president of, of APSA about the time that was formed and I was on the board. But uh, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I did send money, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I really didn't have a, a large part of that. That was, that was Dr. Grossfeld's baby and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and he did uh, virtually all, all of that. I was very happy to see uh, some of the data on one of the boards out here about uh, how much it is funded. I think it's 
has, has done, done a lot. I wish I'd have thought about that when I was president. It was good. Good idea. <laughs> okay. You spoke a little bit about the um, Association of Surgeons in Texas and what an independent group that was. <laughs> so What's that? The, you spoke earlier of the Association of Surgeons in Texas. Oh. And what an independent group that was. How did... Well, it was. It, uh, we were just like everybody. We wanted to do anything we could do to stimulate referrals. And so uh, they were very, very receptive to us uh, uh, becoming members of the, of the society. And we used to invite a, a guest speaker. I know Jay Grossfeld came one year. Hardy Hedren came one year. And uh, that kind of helped us. But uh, like all the other things I've been hearing about, uh, especially what Dr. Raffenberg was talking about, they, they, they all passed. Uh, just like we used to do all the urology at, at home. And I know uh, Dr. Leap did when he was in Kansas because he trained, he and Dr. Holder trained Charlie Mann. So, mm -hmm. but that's all gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Leap, you know we have a new revamped logo for APSA this year. I think you can see it on the monitors there um, <clears throat> in miniature. But um, you... Um, You've told an interesting story in the past about the origin of the original logo. And can you tell us how that, how that came about and who the model for the original drawing was? Sure. We, uh, when we were getting things ready for the first meeting, um, it seemed to me we had, a, had to have a logo. And so I got hold of the medical illustrator at the University of Kansas, where I was, and uh, and had her draw up some different ideas, of, et cetera. And she had four or five of them. And, and um, you know, one of them particularly looked good, I thought, but it just it looked stiff and it, didn't, it wasn't very realistic. It was a picture of a surgeon holding a baby, which I thought was kind of a neat idea, but it just didn't, just didn't have it. And, um, and it was apparent to me she'd never seen a surgeon in uniform uh, with a mask and so forth. So uh, Keith Ashcraft was our, our, our chief resident then, and I said, Keith, come in here and dress up and hold a baby and let her see what it looks like. <laughs> so he did, and she took a picture of him, and she drew it, and then it worked out pretty well, and it lasted Good. for 50 years. <laughs> Good. Do you approve of the, of the new logo? Do you approve of our new logo? Well, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> new things for new days. Good. Then you have to ask Dr. Anderson about her contribution to logo evolution. Oh, yes. Well, when I, w when I was uh, inducted into APSA, there were only a, a handful of female pediatric surgeons, Benji Brooks, Anita Fowler, Betty Carillas, Rowena Spencer, Jesse Turnberg, and Louise Schnaufer. So we were rather in the minorities, to say the least. And after the number of women became much greater percentage, I thought perhaps it was um, appropriate to have a gender neutral uh, logo. And I made that proposal at a meeting and and I don't know whether Keith Ashcraft has ever spoken to me again. <laughs> <laughs> but that sort of percolated a little bit. And then I think Henri Ford, who was my successor at LA, uh, took it a little one step further and it gradually evolved. But in the meantime, I became president of APSA. Well, Hardy Hendren, who many of you saw uh, last night, a great icon uh, of surgery. <clears throat> he was extremely supportive of women from the time I was a medical student when I first met him. And he decided it was not right for me to wear Keith Ashcraft on my lapel. <laughs> <laughs> so what he did was he asked me to take a, an identical picture of myself, I didn't hold a baby, I think I may have held my cocker spaniel or something. But, <laughs> but uh, Hardy went to somewhere that made a logo with my profile on it and a little diamond in my ear. <laughs> and the women uh, uh, presidents since then have that. But you know, in a way, 
was just as sexist, sexist as it being a man on the logo. So that's how it evolved. And, uh, and Ron Herschel finally brought it to uh, fruition that it is truly gender neutral. And I think that's good. But I'm going to continue to wear <laughs> this and the new logo. <laughs> <laughs> Don, I think you have yeah, someone uh, else who'd like to. Dr. Otherson has a comment. I don't have any wild and woolly stories like uh, Alberto had, but I can tell you, particularly for the younger people here, that most of the people that I've met in pediatric surgery have been wonderful. Uh, greatest people you'd want to know, like the tribute we had to uh, Judah Folkman. Uh, he was not only the sharpest m mentally of any person I've ever known, but he's also one of the nicest people. And I was inspired to go into pediatric surgery by reading Willis Potts' book, The Surgeon and the Child. And with his compassion that he has, that comes through in that little book, it really meant a lot to me. And most of the people who went into pediatric surgery didn't go in to make more money because you would spend an extra two years and you probably, your income would probably drop because uh, most of the patients couldn't afford uh, uh, to pay you uh, at the time uh, before they were all funded. So that everybody went into pediatric surgery because they really felt strongly that they wanted to improve the care of children. And I think the, the logo that we have now illustrates that, the, the, uh, the fact that we're saving not just lives, but lifetimes. And the, this is such a marvelous profession to be in. And APSA, I think, is from its humble beginnings is really on the way, on the right track now. So thank you very much for everything all your young people are doing now. Now, before we open it up to the floor, I'd like to ask our panelists if they could briefly um, give us an estimation of what they see as the greatest challenge for APSA going forward in the next 50 years. Oh, Lord. Dr. Pena, would you like to start us off? Well, um, let me say something about the, um, a little bit about Dr. Judah Folkman and related to your question. Sure. Um, Dr. Folkman was an, uh, an inspiration for us. Making rounds with Dr. Folkman was something fascinating because even if you were making rounds about a patient with a patient with appendicitis, he would manage to generate a fantastic discussion about that particular patient and many implications. Every time we make rounds with him, I personally felt like I wanted to go back and be, be dedicated to research because he was such an inspiration uh, personality. So then I went back to Mexico, and every year I used to visit Dr. Folkman and Dr. Gross when he was retired in Vermont. And Dr. Folkman was very generous with his time talking to me, and every year I did the same. In Mexico, I, um, I accepted the job as director of the National Institute of Pediatrics, and I, I continued visiting Dr. Folkman, and one day I visited him and he said, Alberto, I want to tell you that I resigned as a surgeon in chief. I want to go back to the lab. And so it was all because, because he wanted to go back to the, to the kind of work that really inspired him. The passion was in research. And so I was so impressed by that decision that I went back to Mexico and resigned as a director of the National Institute of Pediatrics. And not only that, but I promised never to accept an administrative job for the rest of my life and work in what I like the most, which is operating children. And, that, and that's something very important, I think, for the new generation of pediatric surgeons, because we hear about the scientist surgeon all the time. And, um, and of course, the, we all have ideas when we operate, when we see sick patients, and we want to go to the lab to see to, to prove an idea that we have. 
but there is always also people that is has really passion for, for, for in research. The, if we look at the history of those who changed the world because of, they were so creative, they, what they had in common, I mean, Einstein and Dr. Judah Folkman and, and, um, and Galileo and so forth, they, what they had in common was a intense curiosity to answer a question. Not because they're going to, going to be promoted in the, in the academic world, not because they will get more money, not because the chief of surgery told them prepare a paper for APSA, not because of that, but rather because they have to answer that question. And many times, the answer of that question will not only will not give them advantages, but actually give them trouble, like in Darwin, and then almost, and, and also Galileo, you know, that almost died. So those young who, surgeons, uh, uh, members of the audience who, who really feel passion to do research, don't hesitate to do what Dr. Folkman did. Dr. Folkman, I understand, that was nominated four times for Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. The question is, if those 10 years that he spent as a surgeon in chief were dedicated to his research, perhaps he would be, be a Nobel Prize, you know? So um, he was a good surgeon, but his passion was not in that and did not have experience, something, if, if you dedicate your life to operate children, an entire life is not enough to learn enough, and you, you, you leave feeling that your job was never completed because you never mastered the art, art of surgery. So the fantasize of being 50-50 is uh, be careful about that because you, it depends on your standards, that your quality, standards of quality that you have. So that's what I got from Dr. Folkman, and I was, I was very fortunate to be part of that. Thank you, Dr. Pena. Dr. Corin, what do you see as our challenges? Well, I think the big challenge now is uh, what's happening with the expansion and uh, explosion, in a way, of uh, programs, training programs, where we're not uh, getting uh, the opportunity, or the, the residents are not getting the opportunity do, to do a large number of the operations we think of as important in pediatric surgery. The classical one, of course, is the esophageal atresia repair, and I'm concerned about 64 or 67 programs today. I'm not sure about that number, and the dilution of all the very key operations that we went into pediatric surgery to take care of. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's a thing we have to address before pediatric surgery becomes the same as general surgery. You know, a general surgeon today basically does hernias and gallbladders uh, and not much else. And I'm afraid we could get into that situation in pediatric surgery doing hernias and appendicitis. I'm not, I don't want to be critical about the fact that all these programs are in, in place, but we've got to be realistic about whether or not this is going to dilute the cases, the key cases enough to the point that a lot of young people will not want to go in to this specialty. Mm -hmm. Definitely something for us to wrestle with. Yeah, we will have many years <laughs> to, to work that out. Kristen, Kristen, uh, Dr. Oh, Dr. Bartlett, Bartlett is yes. over here and uh, uh, he has had a key role in the development of APSA and uh, particularly the mentorship of a lot of the members here. Yes. Dr. Bartlett. Thanks, I'm Bob Bartlett for those of you who I don't know. Uh, Don Nakamura has been writing these fabulous vignettes you've been getting on your email, I'm sure. And, and I've, I've, have, having known many of those people, I've, I thought they were wonderful. But on the most recent one, I, I emailed back to Don, uh, it had to do with exclusivity of pediatric surgeons, and said, you know, there's some of us out here have been operating on children for a long time uh, that, are, that are not exclusively doing that. And it's a bit of the history. So uh, my wife and I have unique connections to Dr. Gross and, and to Judah and Paul Folkman, people like that. So we've been involved with this, but another Brigham resident with Arnie and I and, and Al Gazaniga went out to California. And so Al and I were, were doing all the surgery in our brand new academic program at UC Irvine, which meant pediatric, vascular, general, thoracic, cardiac, and anyone else who'd lie down and and be operated on. So we had this wonderful <laughs> practice. So I really enjoyed Dr. Raffensberger's comments uh, because we, we lived that very unusual life as many of the older group here did for a long time. So when APSA was founded in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, 
the same time the Society for Thoracic Surgeons was founded uh, along very similar lines. We want to include everybody, but you have to do only that. So Al and I did not apply for membership in APSA or in STS just because of where we were, although just to remind you, there are a lot of people out there who are doing good things in surgery for, for children who, who uh, don't make that their exclusive practice. However, uh, I've been thrilled to be associated with this institution for all these years. I have dear friends, many of whom are sitting up there on the stage. And uh, I think when Arvin was president, I became an honorary member of APSA. So I'm proud to say that I am indeed a member of APSA. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bartlett. And we're glad to have you, Dr. Bartlett. <laughs> Dr. Anderson. Well, I think the challenges are, have already been articulated by Arnie, the, the uh, number, the proliferating programs, and also by Dr. Raffensperger, the dilution of the um, experience, which we as older surgeons enjoyed to the full. But what I would like to say to the young people, I don't know how you're going to deal with these uh, challenges, but the most important thing is to pass on your knowledge to the younger surgeons coming up behind you, to try and motivate by talking to medical students, surgical residents, internal, uh, internist uh, residents, et, et cetera, that surgery needs to remain a vital uh, commodity, if you will, in, in the, not only this country, but in the world. Mm -hmm. So teach, teach, teach. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Dr. Leap. Well, as, as you know, I haven't been involved in pediatric surgery for a while. But uh, I have uh, been interested in quality of care issues, and one of the one of the big issues there has been uh, the relationship of volume to uh, outcomes. <clears throat> and in a number of critical uh, adult surgical conditions, uh, such as aortic aneurysms and and esophageal operations and so forth, there's pretty good evidence that there is a link between the number of cases people do and the outcomes. There's also pretty good evidence that there are people who do a small number and do them very well. So that is far from being a clear one-to-one -one relationship. However, there are payers who have decided they would not pay for surgery done by surgeons who did not do a certain minimum number. Um, I would hope we would not come that, to that in pediatric surgery, but I do share the distress that Arnie has expressed. When I uh, when I was, uh, when we were just getting APSA going, uh, for a number of years I ran the matching program and um, at that time had the opportunity to see uh, the number of index cases that the graduates did and, and most of those programs, uh, they really had an excellent experience. I think we had 14 programs at the time and I argued very strenuously at the Board of Governors meeting that it should be limited to 20. Now, that seems like a rather humorous number now, I guess. But uh, clearly, um, there is no way you can maintain your expertise if you don't do a certain number of, of cases. And uh, I, I think it's a very serious problem. I think it's so serious that, that, the out, that the solution is going to be that programs are going to be required to shut down. And I'm not sure who, is the, who should make that kind of decision, but the sooner you do it, the better you'll be. Yes, I agree. Uh, Kristen, I think Marshall yeah. Schwartz is being, uh, is, has been involved very heavily with health policy, and I, he might have something to say about it. Thank you, Don. So we're talking about threats, and um, first of all, I would like to say is where pediatric surgery is right now relative to 50 years ago or 40 years ago when I uh, got involved in it a little more than 40 years ago, uh, is dramatic, uh, it's wonderful, it's uh, clinical care, it's uh, basic science research, uh, and more recently involvement in, in health policy and advocacy, and this is the thing I've been most delighted to see as it relates to APSA. 
I got interested in this area in the 1990s when I was in D.C. and realized that not just pediatric surgeons, but the field of surgery had really abandoned the concept of being involved with the federal government and state governments about uh, trying to influence our future. And uh, through the American College of Surgeons, uh, we've made significant strides uh, in our influence. And I think as pediatric surgeons, we have to do the same. Um, the government's going to do what it wants to do unless it has information that tells us, tells them uh, what our priorities are and why. And uh, we have a mechanism now through the college to do that. And um, I, I want to encourage everybody in the audience, the young people, to pay attention to that because it is another threat. We are in the uh, phases here of an entirely new healthcare delivery system for which we have no idea where it's going to end up. Um, and uh, so if we're not at the table, all of us, uh, in influencing that, it's going to be another threat. But it could turn out to be an advantage. So um, keep that in mind. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. And Dr. Ellis. What do you see as the greatest challenges for APSA going forward in the next 50 years? Okay, I'm glad you refreshed the question uh, <laughs> for, for, for me in the audience. Uh, well, I don't know. I, uh, I've been out of it since 1995, and, uh, and I do stay in touch uh, with the pediatric surgeons in Fort Worth and sort of know what their problems are. Um, obviously, uh, the organization was primarily established for education, so I think you have to continue that. Uh, but I think there are other things you should advocate for. Uh, I, as I was sitting here listening, uh, I remember that a, uh, a very excellent surgeon in Dallas told me that, that one year he did 22 esophageal atresias. And, and I recall uh, talking about this with Dr. Dale Johnson, and, and apparently they have numbers like that too. But I know that when I retired in 1995, we were doing 8 to 10 a year. Uh, and that, uh, we had uh, five surgeons. That means you're doing two a year. Yeah. Um, and and uh, yeah. uh, it was an operation actually I felt very comfortable with, but I certainly agree with, with the tenant that the more you do, the better you get, or you should. Uh, and so uh, I think, uh, <laughs> and I think, I think you ought to do that. Uh, I always love to hear Dr. Raffensperger. I would have loved to have trained with him uh, because of the way he makes you think uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but he, if I got him, and I'm having a little trouble hearing, frankly, uh, he was talking about the decline of, of the other aspects of, of children's surgery that we were doing, like the, uh, uh, not so much the cardiac, but like urology. Because that was uh, it, where I was, we did it all, and, and we were probably a third of what we were doing was that. It certainly does uh, in, increase your practice and uh, allows you to have, a, have a, a bigger staff. So I don't know. I just say education is going to be your, is your big thing you need to pay attention to. But you have to be concerned uh, about the economics for the, for the mm -hmm. members. Thank you, Dr. Ellison. To follow up, I think Dr. Raffensperger had something else he wanted to say. Yeah, I never could keep my mouth shut. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to comment on what Dr. Anderson said about teaching. We have to be very careful what we teach. The farther we get away from the source, the more diluted and uh, the more mistakes are made. Consider that symposium yesterday on Hirschsprung's disease. It was all I could do to keep from vomiting on the floor. It was so bad. Those pictures of a patchless anus, that is absolutely malpractice. I would suggest that a part of your teaching should be to force every graduate to go back and read the originals. I would wager that nobody on that panel yesterday had read any of Dr. Swenson's original papers. There was a discussion of rectal biopsy, but nobody said that the surgeon should also go look at that biopsy. A pediatric surgeon should be able to read a biopsy as well as a, or better than a pathologist. And I think we're getting away from basic anatomy and pathology. 
when you look at the complications of a report in Hirschsprung's disease, it's basically that nobody paid attention to the essential pathology, the transition zone, and the anatomy. So I would strongly suggest that you create a body of literature that goes back to the original. I think every pediatric surgery resident should read Dr. Gross's book. If you did nothing else but follow his book, you probably would be practicing pretty good pediatric surgery. Hmm. I agree. Thank you very much, Dr. Raffensberger. Now, Don has let me know that we have two very distinguished guests in our midst right, right now. And if I could ask them to stand, Margie Grossfeld is here and Paula Folkman. If they could please oh. stand so we can thank them. So much. Susan, Susan. Margie Gross, Grossfeld, standing for Margie. I, I didn't catch the second one. Uh, oh, Judah's wife. I can't see him, but she's oh, in the audience. Judah's wife. Also. Judah's wife. Yeah. I know her name. Susie but. was with her. Paula. Also. Paula. I, Paula. No. I hear Susan, Susan Tapper is also here. Is Susan Tapper here? Get up. Susan. Everyone. Susie Tapper. You, Susan. Oh, yeah. I saw her last night. Oh, okay. You, did right. you know her? Um, Jay Vacanti would like to make a comment. So, is there a mic near Jay? I'm, it's very close. Thank you. <laughs> so I appreciate the moment. I want to thank the panel. But mostly I wanted to say to the young people, there's another very important teaching point that all of the people on the panel represent and the leaders that have been discussed represent. And that is grace and focus under adversity. And why do I say that? Well, I have a 35-year direct history with Judah Folkman and almost a 45-year history with Dr. Hendren. And I can tell you that all of the things you have heard are absolutely true. But what you didn't hear is the adversity that those people were exposed to over the course of their career. And in order to continue their career, make their contributions, they did it with grace and they did it with extraordinary focus. And I think that all of you who want to emulate those people should remember it won't be an easy path, but it will be an important path. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a few minutes left. If there's anyone who would like to ask a question or have a comment. Over here in the corner. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm Oscar Gomez from Spain. And I just want to say uh, to all your professors, thank you very much because I'm representing here uh, the European Pediatric Surgery. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, we are getting this beautiful uh, career. Thank you to you. Thank you to you all, professor, for a start this nice history. So I'm feeling very proud to be a pediatric surgeon. I just want to say thank you very much, professors. Mm. Silence. Dr. Langham. Um, I would like to ask Dr. Anderson to give us brief reflection on our relationship with the American College of Surgeons. I remember the pride I had in having a pediatric surgeon as the president, first woman president. We haven't heard, we've heard about, a lot about the surgical section, but I'd like to hear a little bit about the college. Well, the comment that I would like to make is that the American College of Surgeons is devoted to pediatric surgery and pediatric surgeons. And let me tell you why. It may have something to do with the reason that we started with the AAP. Dick, you'll remember this, because the college had, didn't want anything to do with us as a specialty. That, that being said, they are now extremely interested in pediatric surgery because as specialists have develop their own associations, urology, orthopedics, neurosurgery, uh, ophthalmology, etc. 
there have been fewer and fewer percentage of those groups that also have an FACS after their name. Pediatric surgery was, is almost 100% of its members, pediatric surgeons, are also fellows of the college. And the college is doing wonderful things. Marshall already to the, uh, um, alluded to this in his um, health and policy um, endeavors, and he is a regent of the college. And I think that we should foster a very, very close relationship and everybody who's a pediatric surgeon really should belong to the college. We have a question over here. Yep. I think our last question of the day. Oh, uh, less of a question and more of a thank you. Um, as part of the 50th group to be inducted into this prestigious society, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you, um, everybody up there, everybody here in the audience, for all the mentorship that you have given to us um, as a new group. And I just want to say thank you for the inspiration that you've reinvigorated in me today, and I'm sure as well as all of my colleagues, and that I hope that we can only continue to carry just a, just a little bit of what you've given us today and throughout the last 50 years. Thank you so much. Thank you again to our panel oh. and to all of you for participating. Oh. We have really... Uh, I think we'll have one more. Real okay. Quick. <laughs> Hi. Cynthia. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pena, um, we've celebrated a lot of firsts um, during, this during this meeting, and it's been wonderful. Uh, my question to you is, are you the first Hispanic pediatric surgeon trained in the United States? What's the question? Do you know if you're the first Hispanic pediatric surgeon to train in the United States? Pretty much. Perhaps, perhaps. Because I think you are. And, and <laughs> perhaps. Well, that, are you referring I, to good ones or bad ones? <laughs> I, I, did, I, I didn't either. Did you so know that's Rowena? a history we need to write. The, the only one that counts. Well, did you know at all? all right. Rowena. Thank you, everybody, for a spectacular yeah. time and a round of applause for our panel <laughs> and for Dr. Zeller. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'll do even better. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank so you. Much.